I'm Pam Rollins, and I'm an associate professor at UTD Collier Center, and um, I'm also a speech-language pathologist. And as Dr. Sweeney said, um, this is the Autism Center's a collaborative effort. Oops, I'll tell my disclosures in a second. Um, and so um, we're very pleased that the Callier Center can be a part of it. And we'll have speech pathologists up at the center. But the Callier Center is a nationally renowned um, center for communication disorders. We've been working with individuals with autism for 30 years, um, way before it was popular. And we have um, individual and um, group therapy sessions. It's also a considered to be speech pathology, a behavioral type intervention that's really important. Um, and we have two locations, one in Dallas and on Southwestern's campus, and one at, in Richardson on um, UT Deeks campus. I need to do my disclosures. I have funding from the Department of Aging and Disabilities, and I consult with um, Hanson Robotics on interventions with robots, actually. Um, so what I'm really going to do, my talk is on um, social communication and language in individuals with autism. And what we've already learned is that social communication is a core deficit. So a lot of what I'm going to say, you've heard in a sense. Um, and what I'm really going to be doing a lot is drilling down on some of the things on social communication that Preston talked about. Um, that's why we have similar videotapes, and he was asking about that. So this looks like a messy chart, but the whole time I'm here, I'm going to be unpacking this chart. Um, what we find for social communication and language, it's the intersection of these um, four skills down here. It's the intersection, and we need to understand the developmental trajectory of social cognition, of communicative intention, of word processing and expressive language. So I'm going to talk about the developmental trajectory. But what also happens is that these things intersect in a way that it creates um, three distinct levels in an infancy. So I'm also going to be talking about how these skills intersect to create these different levels in infancy. And what my main focus today is going to be really on differentiating level two and level three. This is because so many of the kids with autism and the ones that it's hard to figure out if they have a diagnosis get stuck at this level two. So we'll be talking lots about level two and not getting to real true social communication, which is really at level three. So that's what we're going to be doing in my time with you. So in terms of social cognition, there are um, qualitative changes that infants go through, and you must see this, you're all pediatricians, um, during the first 12 to 24 months of life. And these changes are really on how children monitor, control, predict, and share information with other people. And the stages that I call level one is sharing emotions, level two, sharing perceptions, and level three, sharing intentions. So let's look at these levels. About two months of age, in the, um, kids become more alert, and they start the sm social smile. So it's the first time that they're really being much more responsive to social stimuli. Um, the interactions are dyadic, they're face to face, face. They spend more time, especially in Western cultures, um, with mutual gazing and responsivity. Um, Dr. Wiles talked about this responsivity, um, this reciprocal interaction that happens. It starts at two months of age. It goes throughout um, infancy and early toddlerhood, but it really starts at two months of age. These early social responses are balanced and rhythmic. In fact, many people call these proto-conversations because they really, really look like conversations, but they don't have words. In fact, in the conversational literature, it really goes back to this stage. This is where reciprocity, back and forth conversation goes. Well, as an infant turns about six months of age, they become interested in objects. So as they become interested in objects, the interaction now becomes triadic. It's the, um, the caregiver, the child, and the object. 
And what's happening here is the reason this is shared, the reason this interaction is shared is because the caregiver comes over and shares the experience with the child. The child is unaware um, in, um, cognitively that they're sharing this experience with the caregiver. So it's a shared experience, but only because the um, caregiver is sharing the child's um, perspective. Now, there's a lot of things a child at level two, as sharing perceptions and pursuing goals child can do, that is important. They are goal-directed. And in a few minutes, I'll show you some videotapes of children who are goal-directed. They have selective attention to specific goals, and they're going to persist until that goal is met. When the goal's met, they're going to be happy, and you know what's going to happen when the goal's not met. They understand others have goals, and so they begin to monitor other individuals' actions. So it doesn't mean that they're not going to look at an individual because they're monitoring what's going on, and they can predict what's coming next. Um, that means they can take turns, and this is really important. If this mother decides she wants to build a block tower, she may be put another block on the first block, and the child understands the mom has a goal. And the child can think, oh, we have the goal of building a block tower. And they begin to alternate and take turns at to build this block tower, OK? So it looks like there's a lot of interaction going on and a lot of shared interaction going on. But it's simply that the child can monitor the other person's action, knows the other person has goals, and can predict. What's not happening in this interaction is the baby is not looking at the block and looking at the mom and saying, wow, look, we're doing this together. So this is not a true social interaction. It is not a true social interaction until level three when the child can share attention and intention. This happens in typical babies about 10 to 12 months of age, and it's throughout and gets much more established into the second year of life. Now they have mutual um, knowledge that they're doing something together. So now it's not that they're experiencing the same thing, they're experiencing the same thing together, and the baby understands that togetherness. It often is demonstrated by um, a three-point gaze shift, which you saw in some of the videos. I'll show it to you again, where the baby's looking at the object, looks up at the parent or the caregiver, and then looks back, or the doctor, right? They can coordinate plans, so this means they can take both roles in the interaction. This is one of the reasons why um, games like peekaboo and patty cake are so, so important. And when the it, child can begin to take the other role, the parent's role in the interaction, begin to initiate it and show that they have role reversibility. It's a very, very important step in terms of true social communication. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you some video clips, again from the Autism Speaks website, um, first of a child that I think we've seen already um, who um, has shared attention, and then we're going to go look at a couple of level two children who don't have that shared attention but have all those other skills that I talked about. So far she's not demonstrating sharing. There it is. She now looked up and looked back. So she did that three-point gaze shift. And now she looks up again to share the information. Of course, the clinician's off the side. Okay, so that's a child who shares. We've seen her before. We've seen other sharing that this child does. This is a little boy who's in level two. He's about 18 months, I think. 
What we're going to see um, is that he has selective attention to um, the bubbles and he's going to persist. He really, really wants to get those bubbles um, open. He monitored the mom. And he's very persistent. He has a goal in mind. He's going to sign open. So he's doing a request of sorts. And he's unhappy. OK. This is another little boy. I want you to notice how quiet this videotape is. Um, it sounds like it has no sounds. It's nobody's talking. The baby has no vocalizations. Um, it's a tw uh, two and a half year old little boy. He's going very goal directed. He's looking for his bubbles um, in the um, container. So he's off. He came over to get the bubbles out of the container. He's searching through the container for until he finds it. He can monitor his mom. He can predict that she can give him bubbles. So she can give the, um, gives it to mom to play with the bubbles. But notice he never looks at mom. He, they're sharing the same experience, but he's not doing it together with her. There's not that sharing of emotion and sharing of attention that you would expect. And this little child is interesting because he's taking turns. You're going to see a lot of turn taking in this. And he's also happy. So he has more affect than some of the other children that we've looked at. He monitors the adult. You'll also notice he doesn't respond to the adult's joint, um, joint attention. He doesn't respond to the, joint, the adult's pointing. So he's um, what you would expect in a level three child. And he's like, please, yeah, I want to do this with you. She's off to something else, but he's still trying to take turns. And he's happy, but notice he's never looking up towards her eyes. It's always until she puts her hand on her face. And he's now looking because she's banging on it. Okay. So those are some level, three ch level two children. And what, I wanna, what I'm really pointing out is there's a lot of skills that level two children do. And because they know that other people have goals, it's misleading because they can take turns. They can do certain things, but they're not sharing with the other person. So I've now finished the first line of my chart, and I'm into my second line of my chart, social communication or um, intentional communication. And we find that intentional communication in infants happen at about nine months of age. Um, at nine months of age is still when the child's in that level two. And they can uh, influence another person's behavior as we saw in the videotapes that I just showed you. So they can request, they can protest, um, and do things that influence another person's behavior. What they're not doing, what they're not doing is influencing another person's mind. And influencing another person's mind happens in level three when they direct attention, when they point. Um, when you point, it's a really, really important skill because you have to have the awareness that other people can attend to anything else in the room. Some of you are attending down to your paper, some of you are attending out to um, the clock or the coffee. So I know that you can attend to a lot of different things. But if I want you to attend to what I want to attend to, I have to give you some kind of a signal. I have to say, there's nothing to look at. Look, right, or to point. And what happens when babies point, they're now saying, I want you to attend to what I'm attending to. So they usually point, and then they'll look back to see if you're looking at them, and then they'll look again. That's a different kind of point than if they w are requesting, if they're going, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, right, to request something. But if they're really doing that three-point gaze shift, it means that they want to share something with you. They also do it by showing, are you looking at this? We saw that beautiful little girl, I think I show her again in a second, who shows the mom something. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? This is really cool. Um, and then when they get language, they begin to comment and they begin to talk about things that are in the present with them. 
So let's look at here. I think we've seen one of her before, but we're going to look at this cute little baby. Um, directing and sharing attention. There she goes. And then there was a little look to the mom. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? And we've seen this bubble one, but we'll just show it again. In terms of the communication that's going on here. Showing. I'm going to show it to you. I'm not giving it to you. Do you see it? And now transfer of object, which is a, a low-level request. So what we see is intention happens, that if you have the cognitive skill of sharing perceptions of level two, you can change other people's actions. You can change their behavior. If you have level three, which is really what is shared, which really is social, then you can change somebody's mind and make sure they're looking at what you're looking at. So how do these cognitive and intentions relate to later language? A lot of the babies start pre-verbally doing these types of things, and these pre early pre-verbal communications relate to the later language skills that the children have. And what we find is that there's a differential effect of intentional communication to later language development. We have found, and a lot of my research has looked into this over the years, that a child who has behavior regulations can get to the 50 word stage. But in autism, it's many more than 50 words. They can have isolated words and they can have um, sentences. So they might um, say, you know, I want cookie, please, right? That would be a sentence, because it's now a request, right? I want um, uh, drink. But in order to get shared, uh, true language, to get to the true language, this stage here, uh, true rule governed language, which is what we want, they have to be doing something else. They have to be doing shared attention. Now, why is this? Why does it happen? How can you get only isolated words here and get true rule governed language for shared attention? Well, I think the answer is in the word learning mechanism that underlines uh, language. And what we have found is that the mechanisms for word learning and language change over time as a child develops. So infants and children who are in that level two, they are pure associationists. They are pairing words, that things that they're hearing, the perceptual information of what they're hearing, which is words, which what they're seeing, which is objects. So it's a very associationist mechanism. They're seeing the objects. They can label the objects. They can request the objects, etc. Okay. Now toddlers, when um, and children who are in level three they're going to rely more on social cues. They're going to rely more on where the individual is looking. I know you have a brain different than mine, so I can pay attention to where you're looking, and I know you're looking someplace else than where I'm looking, right? They also, what is intended? Gee, mom never said that word before. That's a new object. She must be intending to mean the object I've never seen before. So they have a much more social way of learning. Now, this is really important, and this is um, one of my um, pet peeves on, on terms of language. When children stay in level two, and what happens in kids with autism is they stay in level two for protracted periods of time. They don't have true social communication. But they begin to have these early word learning mechanisms. So they're associating names with objects, and they're beginning to talk. And what happens as they get older, they begin to label. They begin to use words to label things in their environment. Coffee, cup, glass, slide, right? But what they're doing is they're labeling it, but they're not looking up. 
it is not for the other person that they're labeling it. They're only labeling it for themselves. And this is so tricky. This is why I sometimes, when I give this lecture, I call it words are not enough. Because kids on the spectrum have words. They have word combinations. I want cookie, please. But they don't have true social communication. They're not in level three where it's true social communication. So they're using language but it's not social communication. It's not language that is communicative. So I'm going to show you this little boy here. And he's at level two. He's about two and a half. He's labeling. And I want you to notice he's playing with his parents. They're sharing the experience. He has selective attention. He has all of those really good level two kinds of behaviors. And he's labeling with his parents. So it looks like a lot more sophisticated interaction than it actually is. Okay, so that's the kind of interaction where the adult is creating that envelope of it being shared, but the child's not sharing. They're turn-taking. Remember, level two can do turn-taking. They're having that turn-taking interaction. The child's labeling. He was a little echolalic as well. This child couldn't get services. This child couldn't get services in the school because he had words. And that's where, as I say, words are not enough. It has to be social communication. So language can be deceiving. And just to show you the difference is a little boy who is um, in level three, and now he's commenting. He's using his words for communication. Beautiful three-point gay shift. It's important to note, and many of we've said this in many different ways today, that there's a disruption in social communication and social cognition that's unique to kids with on the spectrum. That's unique to um, kids with autism, and it's an early discernible marker. Um, but as Dr. Wiles said. It's something that you, there, it's missing, and so sometimes you miss it, right? And that's why I like to operationalize it in terms of what it is um, that you can see when you're missing social communication. Um, some children on the spectrum are going to show signs of social deficit at birth. They're not going to, they're going to be flatter in affect, and they're not going to do that reciprocal interaction that we talked about. Other kids have typical social interactions and in that they have that dyadic interactions we talked about. And then around six to 10 months of age, around that level two um, time period, they either regress back to level one, but you usually they stop that interaction. They're not sharing emotion with each other or they plateau and they stay in level two for long periods of time. There's other kids who have social development and they go through um, sharing perceptions and pursuing goals and some and they begin to have early joint attention but someplace along 21 to 24 months of age they regress and go back to level two or to level one and so someone asked the question if you um, screen at 18 should you screen at 21 this um, if you screen only at 18, you're going to miss these kids here who have not grown into their autism yet. And so it's really important to continue to screen. And if you have concerns, as Preston said, to screen um, as they um, get a little bit older. 
So now I've done what I said I wanted to do, I think. I've gone through my, um, my graph here, my, um, and what I hope I've shown you is that it is this level two child that I'm very concerned with because they have isolated um, words and phrases. They have some communication, they're requesting and protesting, but they do not have a full range of communicative intention. And it's really important that you see that a child has a full range of communicative intention. Um, and um, that will get them to true language. So just because I'm repeating myself, I've also put it in words that children do, um, at level one don't have intentional communication. They may not have the social emotional reciprocity that would, uh, you'd see in typical children. They don't have words at this level. Those kids often get picked up. They're not playing with toys either. Um, children at level two, they're regulating your behavior. They're requesting, they're protesting. They may be verbal. They may be labeling. They may be using words or sentences to do this. Um, but they're goal-directed, they're persistent, but they don't share information with other people. And then the level three kids um, are sharing information. So that's all that I had for you today. I um, want to point out, as Preston did, you can go online to this um, address and log in. It's free to the Autism Speak site. And then there's many, many videotapes in terms of an overview, social interaction, communication, uh, repetitive behaviors. There's even now a treatment um, the, um, glossary that you can look at different kinds of treatments. And so it's real important to keep brushing up on what these skills look like. Thank you very much.